air war in Vietnam. Sleek jets wielding high-tech missiles rule the sky. To many, the gun is a useless relic of a bygone era. But they couldn't be more wrong. Brutal air combat over Southeast Asia proves pilots still need to put lead on target to survive. Now, you're in the cockpit as American pilots take aim and pull the trigger in some of the most heart-pounding dogfights of the modern age. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. The gun kills of Vietnam, next on Dogfights. The dawn of the air war in Vietnam. Four prop-driven A-1 Sky Raiders launched from the carrier midway drone into hostile skies. They're flying in support of a rescue operation. There was an Air Force pilot who was down in far northwest North Vietnam. And uh, they really wanted to make an effort to get him out. The lumbering Sky Raiders are not there to dogfight. Their mission, use their powerful 20 millimeter cannons to ward off enemy ground troops. But little do they know, they're on a rendezvous with history, the first air-to-air -air gun kill of the Vietnam War. Lieutenant Clinton Johnson flies number three, Element Lee. His radio is damaged. He can't communicate with flight leader Ed Greathouse. Miles from their mission objective, the lead element unexpectedly snaps over and dives for the deck. Johnson wings over and follows. He's missed something big. I noticed we were getting steeper and steeper, and we were reversing course. And I thought, well, we're not anywhere near the pilot yet. I wonder what's going on. <laughs> Johnson instinctively scans the jungle floor for threats. I always had a policy. If the nose was pointing at the ground, the guns were armed, so I armed all my weaponry. Suddenly, a bright streak of yellow outside his canopy. I saw one go by, and I thought, that looks like a Sam, but it's going up to down, and Sam's go down to up. <laughs> then I saw another missile go by, and it hit the ground in front of Ed Greathouse, and we're down pretty low by now. Two North Vietnamese MiG-17s have the drop on the Sky Raiders. The leader is going after Johnson. Shortly thereafter, I looked in my mirror, and there was a guy firing at me. The MiG is spewing out a lethal arc of 37 millimeter and 23 millimeter cannon fire. I could see the two different sizes of tracers going by. The 37s, when they're burning, they're about the size of a tennis ball going by. That's what they look like. The other ones look like fiery golf balls. Clint Johnson has been jumped by an enemy jet with almost every advantage in a dogfight something his Sky Raider was never intended to do. The Douglas A-1 Sky Raider was developed as a dive bomber at the end of World War II. Only its versatility has kept it in service. The Sky Raider's piston engine is far more fuel efficient than a jet. It can stay over target areas for hours at a time, ideal for ground attack and rescue ops. But low and slow means loitering over relentless enemy ground fire. The 
jet guys gave us a lot of grief being old prop pilots. And that made us more aggressive, I think. We were just a tiny bit wilder. The Sky Raider's chief assets are its guns. It is armed with four M3 20 millimeter cannons. Each cannon fires 12 four and a half ounce projectiles every second. A three second burst from the four guns delivers nearly 150 high explosive rounds on target. But the Sky Raider's cannons are optimized for its ground attack role. They are not connected to a lead computing gun sight. The Sky Raider is not designed for air-to-air -air combat, let alone with a premier dogfighter like the Soviet-built MiG-17. The adversary, the MiG-17, was very small, agile, maneuverable, had cannons, two different cannons. The MiG-17 is a single-seat fighter, developed in the 1950s, nearly a decade after the Sky Raider. The jet-powered MiG is far superior in the key aspects of speed and climb rate. Its weapons system is designed for air-to-air -air combat. A single hit from its 37-millimeter cannon could obliterate a Sky Raider. The Sky Raider has one small advantage. Slower prop-driven aircraft can make much tighter turns than high-speed jets. With MiG-17's hot on Johnson's tail, he'll have to outturn his enemies to survive. The Sky Raiders take violent evasive action. The lead element pulls hard to the right. Johnson and wingman Charles Hartman break hard left. The flight is split. Johnson's wings are nearly vertical in the high G turn. His airspeed plummets, but the Sky Raider is built to handle this kind of maneuver. The A-1's thick, wide wing generates more lift than the MiG's swept wing. Johnson can stay aloft at extremely slow speed. The MiG cannot. The Sky Raiders pull tight circular turns. The high-speed MiG can only match the turn for a split second before he overshoots, pulls up, and re-engages. Johnson strains to look over his shoulder. The enemy pilot can't get a shot. He would pull inside of our turn, drop his nose and fire, but he couldn't hold it. And you'd see the tracers fall away. And then you'd relax a little, he'd pull harder, and he'd fire again. After several attempts, the frustrated MiG breaks off. Wingman Charles Hartman squeezes off a burst. The enemy jet easily pulls away. He roared by us and started to climb and went up to about 10,000 feet and sat up there. Johnson and Hartman frantically scan the horizon for the other Americans. I figured we'd better rejoin with our flight leader. You know, that was Navy doctrine. You never split the flight if you can help it. They hug the treetops and race around a small hill. Johnson spots the lead element. They're in trouble. Johnson and Hartman are here. A MiG-17 is here, positioned to strike the other Sky Raiders. The enemy jet opens fire. Johnson must act fast to save the other Americans. With no air-to-air -air missiles, he lashes out with the only weapons he has, his cannons. We had a 90-degree deflection on him. I fired a very short burst. I knew I wasn't going to hit him, but I got his attention. 
But now the MiG snaps violently around to the right. He turned into us, head on. Johnson has saved his flight, but he's put himself and his wingman in mortal danger. The communist MiG bores in for the kill at 450 miles per hour. Johnson's finger is poised on the trigger. There's never been an air-to-air -air gun kill in the Vietnam War. For the Americans, it's make history or die. June 20th, 1965. A-1 Sky Raider pilots Clint Johnson and Charles Hartman are face-to-face -face with a fire-breathing MiG-17. The MiG is in perfect attack position. Its best move would be to nose up into the vertical, where it can use its speed advantage to make slashing attacks. But surprisingly, the MiG continues dead ahead, splitting his offensive fire between the two Sky Raiders. A split second head on pass will decide who lives and who dies. On the Sky Raider, it was a real trigger. It pulled like a regular gun trigger on the stick. High explosive rounds punish the MiG. He actually went between Charlie and me. And Charlie was pretty close to me. <laughs> I thought I was going to hit him. I thought we were going to have a midair. It was close. I felt a thump as I went by him. I had a feeling that maybe the pilot was dead before he hit the ground. No attempt to eject. The Sky Raiders have done the impossible. The two outdated, piston-driven workhorses have claimed an enemy jet with their guns. The Americans look down at the flaming wreckage in the jungle. Right then, I got my radio back. And Greathouse said, are you two idiots still in there? And he was out by the water by that time, almost. And we said, yeah, we're still in here. He said, well, you got 10 unfriendlies coming your way. Johnson and Hartman make a beeline for the carrier. They will share credit for the historic victory. In an era when long-range air-to-air missiles were supposed to reign supreme, the Sky Raider pilots proved that the lowly gun can still make the critical difference in a dogfight. By 1965, dogfighting was no longer a top concern, as new weapons technology was expected to make close-in air combat a thing of the past. Aircraft weapons have evolved from World War I, where there was a single or two nose-mounted machine guns on a biplane fighter, to World War II, where a mix of weapons were uh, placed both in the nose and wing of the fighter aircraft. Some countries, like the UK, went to eight smaller machine guns. The United States often used six or eight larger 50 caliber machine guns. And then Germany and Japan used a mix of machine guns and cannon. These were all with the objective of achieving a weight of fire to destroy the enemy bomber or fighter. As aircraft modernized and grew more rugged, it became clear that 50 caliber machine guns lacked critical stopping power. The shift began toward larger aircraft guns with calibers above 15 millimeter, classified as cannons. But in the mid 50s, the need for cannons was called into question as newer weapons came online. 
technology advanced significantly and many fighters were now carrying missiles and radars. It caused some designers to say, let's leave the, the gun out of the airplane because of weight and the fact that these new missiles would be able to do the job. Introduced in 1960, the supersonic F-4 Phantom quickly became the frontline fighter of the United States Navy and Air Force. It packed two primary offensive weapons, the long-range radar-guided AIM-7 Sparrow missile and the shorter-range AIM-9 heat-seeking Sidewinder missile, but no gun. But as the air war over North Vietnam went hot, F-4s were quickly dragged into maneuvering fights with less technologically advanced dogfighters like the MiG-17. Their missiles were unreliable at close range. For close-in dogfighting, the F-4 Phantom needed a gun. In terms of air-to-air -air combat, it would be nice just like uh, land combat to be able to have a rifle, a pistol, and a knife i.e. an AIM-7 Sparrow, an AIM-9 Sidewinder missile, and a gun to use when it's needed in the right condition. After months of debate, in May of 1967, Air Force top brass decides to add a gun to the Phantom. Not a moment too soon. May 22, 1967. Lieutenant Colonel Robert Titus leads a flight of F-4 Phantoms on an escort mission over North Vietnam. These are among the first gun-equipped Phantoms, escorting 16 F-105 fighter bombers to their target, a supply depot near Hanoi. It's a stretch of sky teeming with MiGs. Titus's flight is high and to the right of the thuds. I could look down and see them, and I was far enough out to where I could not have to divert my attention entirely to them, where I could scan the sky visually. The colonel's backseater, the second pilot who mans the radar and radio controls, is First Lieutenant Mylon Zimmer. I'm on the radar so scope and I'm trying to pick out any contacts that are out in, front of the, out in front of the strike flight so that we have at least have a warning if there's something out there. It appears to be business as usual. But a lethal threat is streaking in behind the Phantoms at over 600 miles per hour. Two gleaming MiG-21s bore in to attack. Titus is here. 1,000 feet above the bombers. Two MiG-21s are here, behind Titus. The MiGs will mount a hit-and-run attack, fire their heat-seeking Atoll missiles, then streak away to avoid a fight. I looked over my shoulder, and here came two MiGs firing missiles. I immediately called a break, and we turned hard left. The enemy missiles failed to guide and dart past. The MiGs firewall the throttle and zoom climb. Titus banks right and kicks in full afterburner. I felt uh, bloodlust. I'm after them. I mean, now they're the target. Turnabout's fair play. The MiGs claw for altitude. The Phantom's twin engines roar. The chase is on. May 22nd, 1967. Four pilots, Lieutenant Colonel Robert Titus and Lieutenant Mylon Zimmer, are hot on the tail of a pair of MiG 21s. The aircraft are climbing at an incredible rate 80 stories every second. 
Titus's twin engines pump out double the thrust of the enemy jet. He's closing fast. Though his F-4 is equipped with a gun, the weapon is not his first priority. My focus is, is closing on this MiG, getting in position to fire a missile. In the back seat of the F-4, Zimmer works the radar controls furiously, trying to get a radar lock for a Sparrow missile shot. In the front seat, Titus waits to get good tone for the heat-seeking cyborg. Bob gets a good growl on the, on the AIM-9 missile. It's, I mean, a real loud growl. Fires the missile. As the Sidewinder slides off the rail, the MiG streaks into the clouds. And the missile tracks right into the same hole that the, the MiG went into. And it went right up his tailpipe and he exploded. I didn't see the explosion, but as we went through the thin cirrus deck, there was debris and smoke and stuff in the air. One MiG down, one to go. Titus applies right rudder to get the MiG in his crosshairs. He orders Zimmer to go bore sight, meaning lock the radar antenna in line with the gun sight. Titus fires a Sparrow missile. The MiG pilot reacts smartly. Well, he saw us coming and he turned hard left and started down. And that's when the dogfight really began. Titus rolls left and pitches down to give chase. The force of G shoves the Phantom pilots back in their seats. The F-4 screams into a power dive. The MiG pilot throws his aircraft all over the sky to shake his deadly shadow. And it was some very high G maneuvers, right and left, up and down, at probably 550 to 600 miles an hour. I mean, we were smoking. It was one hell of a show. The lower the MiG gets, the more it blends in with scattered reflections from the ground. Titus's missiles cannot lock onto the target. A skilled pilot flying the premier fighter of the Soviet bloc is no easy mark. The Soviet-built MiG-21 is a single-seat fighter capable of Mach 2, a worthy adversary to the F-4. The MiG-21 is lighter and more agile, but cannot outrun the more powerful Phantom. The MiG's intense maneuvering can defeat any of Titus's missiles. But this F-4 is packing a gun. What was found in early Vietnam air combat was it would be nice to have the M-7, the M-9, and a cannon so that you covered all the elements of the potential air combat. Once it was discovered that a gun was needed, a bunch of activities took place. One was the design of a gun pod, the SUU-16, which was centerline mounted like a fuel tank. At the heart of the Su-16 was an M61A1 six-barrel 20-millimeter rotary cannon, which operated like a Gatling gun. Power was provided to the cannon by a ram air turbine that popped out into the Phantom's slipstream. As the turbine rotated, an electric current was generated sufficient to spin the barrels. The cannon was capable of an astonishing rate of fire, over 6,000 rounds per minute. But the gun pod had several major drawbacks. The problem was that the centerline fuel tank was taken off to make room for the gun pod, so the aircraft went out and had 600 gallons less fuel. In addition, it was not optimized, the gun pod, to the gun sight. So really, it was kind of a spray and hope philosophy rather than an accurate system. Regardless of its limitations, Phantom pilots now had a weapon to fall back on when their missiles failed. Now, 
Bob Titus flips the master arm switch for his M61A1 cannon. On the belly of his F4, the turbine spins in the slipstream. Titus's gun is primed and ready. His gun sight is worthless. He'll need a hunter's instinct to take the MiG down. Every time I tried to get lead on him, he'd reverse, thereby spoiling my aim. The closer Titus and Zimmer get to the ground, the more immediate the danger. Flak was all around us. I mean, it was everywhere. We had gray flak, black flak, it was all over the place. Two surface-to-air missiles streak up towards the F-4. I look out the canopy, and here's this big telephone pole coming up. I instinctively ducked my head because the, the missile appeared to be close to me. I don't think Titus saw it. I'm not sure if he did or not. I was too focused on the MiG to be concerned with that. My job was to get the MiG. The MiG pilot is running out of options. Titus is closing in. The MiG rolls wings level and begins a high G pullout. Bob Titus yanks back on the stick, straining to pull his nose in front of the MiG. He must compensate for the increased deflection of an externally mounted gun. I didn't know how much lead to put on him, uh, so I just put the pipper at his 12 o'clock position, pulled the trigger, and ran a buzzsaw through him. Bullets rip through the length of the MiG-21. M61 Gatling gun fires 6,000 rounds per minute. So you pull the trigger, it goes boom. That's about 50 rounds of 20 millimeter high explosive incendiary and armor piercing incendiary. Titus pitches up to keep from overshooting. Went high right and pulled G's and came back around on him again. Put the pipper on him, tried to do it again, and the gun had jammed. But the Americans have already done enough damage. looking, and the MiG is floating like this. We got him. He's going in. The pilot didn't get out. Robert Titus and Mylon Zimmer have just killed two MiGs in a single air battle. The second victory, the gun kill, validates the recent argument that F-4s should carry a cannon in addition to their air-to-air -air missiles. Over the next few months, F-4 Phantoms arriving in service in Vietnam have new, updated gun pods. The Su-23 gun pod was an improved follow-on to the Su-16. During combat testing of the Su-16, pilots found that at low speeds, the ram air turbine that powered the cannon failed to produce enough energy to spin the barrels. The new Su-23 featured a more reliable, self-powered cannon and a lead computing gun sight. Having a reliable gun meant that Phantom pilots could be more aggressive in engaging the enemy. Captain D. Simmons is one such pilot. And on November 6, 1967, he'll prove that an aggressive F-4 pilot armed with a gun is a lethal combination. November 6, 1967. Air Force Captain Daryl D. Simmons with backseater Captain George McKinney leads Sapphire flight. It's one of two flights of F-4s escorting an F-105 fighter bomber force to their targets in North Vietnam. Simmons is perched above the bombers, scanning the sky for enemy threats. 
His radio crackles to life with a warning from radar control. Two flights of MiG-17s are about 30 miles south of you, and the MiG-21s are about uh, 250 at 30. Roger. The MiG-21s pose the greater threat. The captain gives the order to drop tanks, then breaks his flight hard left to head them off. In the back seat of the Phantom, George McKinney struggles to get a radar lock. So we can take a look. I'm fine, baby. There were a lot of clouds that day, especially in this sector we turned into. And we were kind of meeting them head on. Their blips merge on the radar scope. Nothing. They were either above us or below us, I don't know. But uh, we never did see them. Simmons is concerned that the MiGs got past him. If so, the F-105 strike force is now in serious jeopardy. He quickly reverses course and powers back toward the fighter bombers. The role of the American fighter pilots largely was offensive, defensive. It was not to go knock down a MiG. It was like shepherds to protect the strike force and, and dissuade the MiGs from becoming involved. The F-4s never spot the MiG-21s. But their diversion has opened the door for a marauding MiG-17. I go, the 11 o'clock low. And he uh, looks and says, those are thuds. And we say, I say, D, the last one's not. He's shooting. And he says, oh, yeah, tally ho. Simmons is here at 5,000 feet. A single MiG-17 is here, 2,000 feet below Simmons, attacking the thuds. Simmons has only seconds to take the MiG out or a bomber will be lost. He'll perform a high G diving turn to position himself behind the MiG. The captain yanks the stick in tight, slams the throttles to full burner, and boots left rudder. His Phantom dives into a 135 degree slicing turn. He quickly accelerates past Mach 1. You're determined. You're either going to get him or you're, or you're going to ram him. <laughs> I think that's kind of the attitude that I took. Just an aggressive feel comes all over you. You're going to attack with everything you've got. His number one mission in life is to get that MiG off of the tail of that 105. Simmons levels out about a mile and a half behind the MiG. At this range, Simmons' best option would be a heat-seeking Sidewinder missile. But with a flight of thuds in front of the MiG, it's too risky to push the button. His missile doesn't know the difference between a friendly heat source and a foe's. So I decided right then and, uh, to use the gun. We fired just a little bit out of range and put some tracers across there to break him off. The MiG spots the tracers and breaks hard left. It seemed to me that the MiG stopped his nose on one molecule of air and just it turned right around. At this point, Simmons has two options. A less experienced pilot could have tried to match that MiG's turn in the same plane, which was not possible with the F-4, meaning he would have overshot the MiG, because then have turned back into us and shot us. Or the highly skilled fighter pilot could recognize that he still has an offensive opportunity, which he did. You cannot turn with him. Well, you have to get into another plane. Simmons takes the fight into the vertical, performing a high-speed yo-yo. 
in a yo-yo, Simmons pulls into a steep climb, reverses, then dives on the MiG, cutting inside his enemy's turn. It's a maneuver that takes advantage of the Phantom's raw power. I just pull straight up then going into the vertical. Climbed about 12,000 feet, airspeed decreased around 200, 220 knots, pretty low for an F-4, at which time he stomps the rudder to get the nose pointed back down, unloads the G off the airplane to allow the airspeed to build back above the mock, and then pulls toward the MiG. The North Vietnamese pilot loses sight of Simmons. I don't think he even saw us, because when I went vertical, I'm sure he looked around and we were way above him. The MiG pilot is unaware that the angel of death is swooping down from above. As we, we start to close the range on the MiG, he realizes that we're there, and he goes into a, a climbing left turn, at which time he pulls the nose well out in front of him, as you have to to pull lead. As the MiG turns, he rolls to reveal the full outline of his aircraft, a perfect target. Simmons pulls the trigger, a three-second burst. Nearly 60 pounds of high explosive and incendiary ammunition devastate the rear half of the MiG-17. Then I was able to look down and see the pieces coming off the airplane, the smoke coming out of the airplane. They just came off of him. I just pulled off, pulled up beside him. He looked at me going down. He stayed with the airplane. And then he ejected just before he hit the trees. And the shoot streamer as he disappeared into the trees. Simmons and McKinney have killed their first big. More importantly, the F-105 strike force hits its target objective and returns home safely. The mission is a complete success. Simmons and McKinney link up with the rest of Sapphire flight and head back toward the Gulf of Tonkin. But mere seconds into their egress, backseater McKinney spots a silver flash. In just looking around, I looked down there and did uh, couldn't believe my eyes. There is another MiG-17 right down there on the treetops headed back to the west. No Phantom crew has ever scored two gun kills in a single engagement. Simmons and McKinney saddle up to make history. November 6th, 1967. Daryl Simmons and George McKinney have a visual on a MiG-17. The enemy jet is hugging the jungle floor, blending in with ground reflections. Firing a heat-seeking missile would be futile, but Simmons is armed with a cannon. Simmons is here at 3,000 feet. The MiG-17 is here. Once again, Simmons will use his diving speed to close the gap. We just lit the burners, unloaded, and uh, like I say, I wanted to put the airplane right in on him. Simmons rolls into a hard left turn. He levels his wings barely 200 feet off the deck and just one mile behind the enemy aircraft. At nearly the speed of sound, his Phantom can cover that distance in a fraction of a second. The MiG hugs the ground, rocketing toward a low hill in the distance. I thought that MiG's tactic was going to be, well, I can turn faster than F-4 cones, so I'm going to fly at this little hill, and at the last minute, I'm going to turn, and I'm just going to let him run into the hill. Simmons has a 200-mile-per-hour overtake speed. He's low to the ground and too close for missiles. Once again, 
he'll have to depend on his gun to make the kill. He's closing on this guy with what we call the speed of heat. I could actually look around the front seat and see a red star on each of the mixed wings. I mean, the were pretty doggone close, and it was time to shoot. I was ready, and I pulled in there as quickly as I could and fired. Simmons' cockpit recorder captures the excitement. OK, Dan, ready for fighting, man. that the first high explosive round went through the MiG's fuel tank because at that point he turns into this great black orange explosion in the sky. That quick. The Phantom is so close to the explosion that Simmons has no choice but to barrel through the churning fireball. Smoke is sucked into the jet's intakes. The Phantom shudders, its engines gasping for breath. We were very, very happy for about three seconds until we went through that fireball. And uh, since there's no oxygen there and disturbed airflow, it, it causes the compressor blades in our jet to stall, which kind of goes boom, boom. Right then, we just thought we had a one-way ticket to the Hanoi Hilton, because <laughs> we were deep in there. We weren't that far out of Hanoi. Their fear is short-lived. The Phantom's compressor blades kick in, and its twin J-79 engines return to full power. Simmons decides it's time to get out of Dodge. Captains Simmons and McKinney make it safely back to base at Ubon, Thailand. Having scored the only double gun kill by a Phantom crew in the entire war. Hey, how'd you do? Two, baby. Beautiful. <laughs> Throughout the course of the Vietnam War, over two dozen MiGs met their demise as a result of 20 millimeter air to air cannon fire. In many of those instances, if the American pilot had not had a gun at his disposal, the MiG would have survived to fight another day. It's definitely, as proven through all the wars, the most effective air-to-air -air weapon is that gun that you can point at the enemy. And if you point it correctly and pull the right lead, it's extremely lethal. Reliability and guidance systems have cemented the missile as the primary weapon of modern air superiority fighters, like the F-15 Eagle and the F-22 Raptor. But the lessons of Vietnam have not been lost. Even these advanced fighters are equipped with internal cannons. In most cases, the cannon was kept because on certain close-in combat situations, Nothing like a cannon, because you can fire it uh, very close in, you can fire it instantaneously, and it won't be decoyed by electronic warfare or any tactics. The bullet will still hit the target. Technology, no matter how advanced, is prone to fail. When it does, the score will be settled up close and personal with guns.